<laughs> and this okay, one. Wait. And this one. So, um, I first heard about Mr. Oke Onyengbule from a friend of mine, Mr. Shagun in Lagos. We Shagun used to have a bespoke clothing store in Lekki Phase 1. We talk a lot about classic menswear a lot. So, he said you should check out this guy. I saw your video on YouTube. My goodness. Ah! I began to watch all your videos. And I even joined your Slack group or something. I began to follow this gentleman. I was like, ah, ah. I said I must have a conversation with this man. And then, I, because of because of your approach to it, your technological approach to it, your your historical approach to classic men's was like, I have never seen this before. And I said, no, I've got to have him on the podcast. So, we are here. Welcome. The prof. We call him the prof. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? Very well. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me. And you've got a great podcast voice. I think you should think about having a podcast sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's come, that's come up very often, but uh, you can't do all things, Paul. You have yeah. to do something. You yeah. Have to do something. Paul. <laughs> yes. F- f- fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, you would talk about your your backstory. Really. I don't like to start with backstory because everybody knows a lot of people about it, read about it. But I want to start with the powerful story about when you saw the movie Wall Street. You were 17 years old when you saw the movie. Correct. You were going to study electrical engineering somewhere in the university, which you actually did. But, but then yes. you spoke the following words to yourself. You said, I don't know what these people are doing, you know. These guys wearing suits with these, with these numbers. But whatever it is, I'm going to do that for, in my life. <laughs> And 10 years after you made that statement, you were on 60, 60th Street, I'll be 60 Kinikon Wall Street on the 27th floor of JP Morgan. You started working there. Tell us about that story. The power of exposing yourself and your children and young people to experiences. It was from a movie. You saw your destiny practically from a movie. Talk to us, sir. Well, thank you, Paul, for the very... Um generous introduction um i like to think of myself as a modest man mm. <laughs> hard as it is to believe uh but thank you very much for the kind words and comments and um and uh introduction uh regarding your question specifically i remember the moment precisely um i was at a friend's place i, I even remember his name his name is chooksy uh Chooks and i were classmates at um at the military school, and we had just completed our military, uh, well, secondary school. We both went to the military school in Joss. And uh, we were just, it was the summer before we were to start university. Mm -hmm. um, And we were both going to study electrical engineering. And the movie Wall Street had just come out and uh, he had a VCR, you know, it was a big deal back then. Mm -hmm. Uh, They had a VCR player and uh, I happened to be visiting and we sat down there and we were watching this movie. And of course it was Michael Douglas and all the other characters. And I remember I was completely mesmerized by the, it was just everything about it, but most importantly was the presentation, Mm -hmm. the character. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the clothing, of course, but not just the clothing, but the entire aura, you know, the aura of power, you know, mm-hmm. masters of the universe and all of that. And I'm, I, I, I told my young self at the time, wow, uh, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. I had mm-hmm. no idea where Wall Street was. Um, I had never even been to the States up to that point. Wow. Uh, and I just said, whatever it is this guy is doing, this is what I want to do. Mm. And and somehow we finished the movie. Life went on. I went on to study engineering for five years. And through a confluence of events, completely un- unrelated and unplanned, mm. uh, and I'm not going to go into details, but uh, I suddenly found myself in the States um, in business school. Uh, studying uh, banking and finance uh, mm. for an MBA. I was studying for an MBA with a major in banking and finance. And um, as fortune, good fortune would have it, I fell into the path of a managing director uh, who was at JP Morgan at the time, mm-hmm. uh, Joe Sabatini uh, mm. specifically was his name. 
uh, he came to my university, to my business school to give mm -hmm. a lecture mm -hmm. on high finance. And I immediately stepped up to the place and I told him that uh, I would love for you to give me an opportunity to speak with you about my interest mm -hmm. uh, in Wall on Wall Street. And uh, he gave me a quizzical look. And after several um, uh, attempts at mm -hmm. uh, persuading him, he actually invited me to New York. And so I went to New York to see him. Uh, he brought me up to his office at 60 Wall Street. And that's really where the story began. And as mm -hmm. I say, the rest, I went through sort of a series of interviews, went through the entire process. It's a very grueling process for anyone who's been through it. A uh, very thorough, very, very thorough process. Uh, but to cut a long story short, um, got through to the end of that process and uh, found myself uh, in the mergers and acquisition group on the 27th floor of 60 Wall Street uh, in natural resources and power, oil and gas and power. Wow. My background before then was engineering and I had worked uh, for with Shell, Schlumberger. So I had a background in oil, oil and gas, yeah. or oil services. And so I was able to parlay that experience uh, in oil and gas uh, into banking as sort of the quote unquote subject matter expert mm -hmm. on the m and uh, at a very junior level, of course, uh, at JP mm. Morgan. Wow, that's so powerful. That's, that's powerful. And it reminds me of what someone said that our dreams don't forget us, even, even if we forget them. <laughs> that's really really powerful that's powerful you once said that you you read a lot of biographies right a lot over a thousand a thousand plus specifically uh, i mean when you, more, yes when you when you read like that of course you start seeing some commonalities mm -hmm. in the different personalities and different uh, uh, lifestyle of this that is where i've lived what were yeah. some of those traits that you saw that kept coming up over and over, even even if in different variations? Well, I can't say that there's a common trait. You know, everybody's got a story. Yeah. Um, and I was um, fortunate enough to read across the board, not just business icons, but also a lot of politics. Mm. I studied Chairman Mao. I studied, uh, you know, Stalin. I read Mein Kampf, uh, which was Hitler's uh, yes uh, book. Opus, uh, Opus, Opus. What is it? Magna Opus. Yes. Um, I read Mein Kampf. Uh, you know, I read. Uh, I read all the great leaders, uh, all the American presidents. I read all the American presidents, beginning from George, George Washington. Um, at least sort of the prominent ones uh, up to the modern ones. In fact, at a point, I had read every one from Roosevelt, uh, FDR, um, all the way up to Clinton. Wow. 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 And Obama, actually. I had read everybody from FDR all the way to Clinton at the time when I really started getting into biographies. Then Obama subsequently became president. And of mm. course, I have a copy of uh, Audacity of Hope and uh, something from my father. Is it dreams from my father? Yes. Uh, of library. But coming back to your question, I think the common theme there is that you have to have a vision. Mm. Mm. Um, life is no accident. Come on. Uh, life is not. Mm. I think that you know you can get you can win the lottery. You can get lucky and win the lottery. Mm -hmm. But to to live what would be considered an ordered life, mm. um, it has to be intentional. Mm. And the common thing about all these people is that they were very intentional, mm. very intentional about what they wanted. Mm. Very intentional. Uh, mm. It wasn't a question. There was no, uh, uh, I think I want to be this, I want to be that. Uh, it was very, very clear from the beginning, I want to be president in the case of Obama or Clinton um, or any other politician, uh, Chairman Mao even, even when he was a junior uh, Communist Party uh, servant. Yes. Um, he knew from the beginning that he wanted to be the leader of the Communist Party and 
he sought to carve out a path mm. that led him there by sort of understanding the party structure, understanding his own strengths, and how he could use his own strengths to sort of to, you know, go up the party ladder. So, and I could say the same for any other business leaders, be they corporate business leaders or entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, most corporate leaders, it's very seldom that somebody somehow stumbles into the corner office or the mm -hmm. CEO office. Mm -hmm. It could be very premeditated. Mm -hmm. Similarly with entrepreneurship, if you're an entrepreneur, you know it from day one. I knew from the get-go I was an entrepreneur. Come on. I knew of course. News. I knew I had to sort of get my ticket punched, as they would say, um, on Wall Street or on Broad Street. Uh, you had to get your ticket punched. You had to earn your bona fides. Mm. But I had no question. There was no question in my mind. Beginning probably at about age 21, 22, there was no question in my mind that I was born to be an entrepreneur. Wow. So an entrepreneurship is not... I think the idea that entrepreneurship is about creating companies or founding, it's a very limiting idea. Mm. Very limiting. Entrepreneurship is a way of life. And all these politicians you see, they're all entrepreneurs. Mm. You know, there was something I remember from Barack Obama's book, Audacity of Hope. He says, politics is the ultimate entrepreneurial game because second place gets nothing. Come on now. First, you get, you get everything. Winner takes all. It's a zero, it's a zero sum it's game. It's a zero sum game. It's a zero sum <laughs> game. This is the ultimate entrepreneurial sport because in business, you could be second best and still get some market share. Mm. You could be third or fourth best and still have some market share. But in politics, you're either top or nothing. And so, you know, it was a moment of clarity for me because I had never quite thought about politics in the same light. Mm. But it is true that even politicians, to a great degree, are all these are all entrepreneurs. Mm. That's powerful. So, you know, uh, again, I know I've sort of veered off your specific question, but I, I think that if I were to point, place a finger on a common theme there, it is that all these individuals were very intentional. Mm. They were highly focused, highly intentional about what it is that they expected out of life. Mm, that's fantastic. I mean, you are the chief executive officer and founder of, of Ask OK. I was saying to myself earlier, I said, this I am not the CEO. I am not, I am not the CEO. I'm just the founder. Okay, yes, just the founder. Okay, <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, good. And um, I mean, you are an entrepreneur. And I like the, the way you are using technology to drive this. All right. Did any of the characters that you've read about, did they influence you in any way, shape or form in terms of clarity or purpose with exactitude and coming with, to the market with something different? Because you are, you are really, really different. Well, I mean, we, people sell tight trousers, tight clothes, but you come up with something entirely, you know, very, very unconventional as it were. Well, there are two ways to answer that question, Paul. Mm. Uh, one is, did any of these characters influence you yeah. uh, in what I do today? Well, they couldn't have because most of them existed in a different, different era. Yes. But they did in the sense that you have to anticipate the future. Mm. Whether it's in politics or business or whatever mm. it is, you have to... You have to be able to read markets and anticipate the future yes. and then place a bet. Mm. And then place a bet on that future, at least your own interpretation of it. Fantastic. Right? Fantastic. Whether it's Steve Jobs, I have his biography here, or Paul Allen, I have his biography, or any of these, I have, you know, um, uh, what's this, Larry Ellison of Oracle. I mean, I read all those guys, all the tech titans. Um, you have to be able to sort of have a sense of where the market is going, it's going yeah, and and get there first. You know, it was Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, yes. who said, he asked, you know, Wayne, what's the secret to your greatness <laughs> uh, after winning so many times? Said, well, it's pretty simple, you know. You just got to figure out where the puck, puck is going, going. And get there first. <laughs> get <the> first. <laughs> I also like the way Charlie Munger put it. He said, 
if you notice that you have the advantage, bet heavily. <laughs> it's powerful, 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 powerful. Mr. So, okay. There's a word that I've heard a lot. It says that perception is reality. My perception of a person is my reality about that person. You dress exceptionally well. Exceptionally well. I'm not saying that because you are here. I've spoken about you before. When I when I told people that you are coming on the podcast, in fact, a guy messaged me from London here. He just started his own fashion business. Successful guy. said, Paul, I will, I, I'm really excited about the angle you want to take this conversation because I really respect this dude. <laughs> So, hey, what happened? All right, so it's been said that perception is reality. That what people perceive about you become their reality of you. We say, okay, you dress exceptionally well. And I'm sure I'm not the first person that has told you that. It's a... It is a it is a it is a global reality that you dress well. You, I'm not right. I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to ring your bell. You already know the whole world knows that. In fact, I, I was telling a friend of mine. A friend of mine saw that you were coming on the pod, and he says, "Paul, I will, I'm really really interested to know how you take the angle of this conversation because I really really expect the guy is is a is a." Is a banker in the UK, a big banker, but just started a fashion brand as well. So how has dressing well helped you in your career? Has it opened doors for you? For you to exemplify or display your competence? I want you to speak to us about the power of looking good as a man. Well, uh, look, Paul, it's, uh, these things are very... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they're uh, intangible. Mm, mm. I speak. Uh, these things are intangible. For instance, one may not be point to a specific. Be a, one may not be able to point to a specific moment mm -hmm. uh, that changed the course of their life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's obvious looking back, mm. right? Sometimes it's actually you know Steve Jobs would always say you know life always makes sense. Yes, look. yes, yes. Um, but looking forward, uh, you, the, one can never quite point to a specific moment or sort of time uh, that could alter one's, um, one's life as it were. Yeah. And it's also very difficult to specifically pin your success at anything or, or even sort of at an interview, say, for instance, it's very difficult to pin your success to sort of the way you dress, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, it's a confluence of things, right? It's, 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 it's the way you dress, it's the way you present yourself, it's your eloquence, it's your composure, uh, it's your elocution and yeah. all of that stuff. However, I consider dressing to be sort of the icing on the cake. It doesn't matter how good the cake is, right? Mm. So if, if it's not properly decorated, it just doesn't look as visually appealing. Mm -hmm. And and that is the same with dressing. Of course, in life, one has to have substance. Mm -hmm. That is a non sequitur. Mm -hmm. So you have to have substance, you have to have gravitas, and all of that stuff. Mm. Uh, but you then have to clothe all of that gravitas in something that looks appealing uh, because uh, people judge you in microseconds, yeah. or milliseconds. Yeah. It was my old boss at J.P. Morgan who told me um, something I will never forget. He says, when people meet you, hmm. never let them forget that they met you. Oh! Come on! <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like ringing the bell Very right cool. now. <laughs> You know, I think the common phrase is, you know, never, you know, never get a second opportunity to make a first impression, but that mm. is trite. You know, that is, very, uh, that is uh, as they would say, that is cliche. Mm. But he told me this, it says, when people meet you, or when, well, actually, this specifically says, when people come into your presence, never let them forget 
that they were in your presence. Mm. Those were exact words. And so, of course, the way you clothe yourself and present yourself is, I would say, number one, because uh, you're going to be judged instantly. People are going to judge you in literally microseconds before they even decide if they ought to hang around to to hear what's in your head or mm -hmm. to see what's in your head or to hear what comes out of your mouth. So it's a door opener uh, for sure. It's a door opener. And uh, I think it's an opportunity that everyone ought to take. Hmm. That's very, that was very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. Um, some of the books that have shaped your life, you said the Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, the Monk Who Sold His Ferrari by Robin Sharma. And mm -hmm. Think and Grow Rich by you. Napoleon Hill. Three powerful. That was one of the first powerful. books I read. Yeah. I read that when I was 22 years old, and that book changed my life. Wow. I can I can literally point to the specific moment where I, I was gifted that book. I was barely 20, I was 21. I'd never really this, I, I, I'd never I'd never been quite studious. I mean, I'd always been a very curious mind, but I was a very restless young man. Mm. Uh, restless, easily distracted. And there was the first time in my life that actually I sat down and I read a book and it made sense. Mm. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It was yeah. the, I remember it so vividly. Hmm. Hmm. So powerful. I mean, with, all, with everything you have going on now, do you still have time to read? Do you read like you, you still used to read? No, 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 Paul. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately. because I mean, I, I heard you say you read, you read with a with a red pen, a marker. I mean, that means you take you really good notes when you when you read. I'm like, with all the with all that you have going on, do you still have time to read? Well, look, Paul, and times have changed. You see, um, just a little backstory here, Paul. I remember when I was a young man in New York City. Mm -hmm. Um, I would go on the weekends. I would go to Strand's bookstore. On Hudson Road. That's a very popular Manhattan. That's, that's a very popular bookstore. Very popular. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. This guy, you're so cool, I man. Go, <laughs> I would go to France and if you know on Saturdays they would put these books on the sidewalk. You know how it is down on Hudson Street, yeah. the lower sort of Manhattan. Very, you know, Saturday mornings, crazy, everybody's music blaring, people yes. just, yeah. and they would put out all these books on the on on the sidewalk. And then and then in uh, strands it was pretty large and then there was a huge basement and most of the books were a dollar hmm. hmm. dollar two dollars these were used books hmm. all of them they didn't sell new books you know strands was sort of basically the poor man's Barnes and noble we used to hmm. call it back then and you know i was no poor man by any means i was a banker on wall street at the time i was making decent money but um but um, I wanted to, I was so hungry to build up my, I was at, it was a very vulnerable point because you may not know this, but I lost my parents quite early. Oh. Um, I lost my father. I was barely 19. My mother followed barely four years after. Whoa. And so here's a young man sort of literally naked in the world. I was completely naked. No, I didn't really have. Uh, any, I had uncles and relatives, but no one who could play that father role or that yeah. father. Yeah. Okay, this is young man. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Mm. This is how you play it. There was no one, and so for me, knowledge was a matter of survival. Mm. Mm. It wasn't sort of. It wasn't. It wasn't. A, you know. It wasn't just this. It wasn't a nice thing. thing. It, wasn't it wasn't a nice to have. <laughs> No, it wasn't a nice to have. It was not sort of this sort of intellectual uh, posturing or parambulating. Uh, for me, knowledge was a question of survival. I knew that if I didn't get this knowledge, I would just die. It was mm. that simple. It, it wasn't a question of it was clear to me that if I didn't teach myself these things, I would die mm. because mm. nobody would care. And so I, I, I would go to Strands every weekend and just literally, I had this military rucksack mm -hmm. and I would, I would literally pack these books 20 at a time, you know, for $20, $30, mm -hmm. I could get them. And they were all hardcover. A lot of them very well preserved. 
Mm. I would only buy hardcover because I knew these were books I wanted to keep for a lifetime. Mm. So I would buy these books. They were hardcover, sometimes a dollar, dollar fifty, two dollars. Put them in my rucksack and then go back to my uh, apartment and just sort of sometimes I would sit through an entire weekend eating books, Ooh. like literally eating books. Whoa. Now, this was sort of late 90s, early 2000s, and this was before internet really became a thing, or yeah. before social media. Thing. I mean, we had email, we had dial-up internet, but those things weren't really a thing. Uh, you just sort of, you logged in, you dialed into the internet to check your email, and then you, and you logged, logged out quickly. Yes. Yeah. You didn't want to kind of rack up uh, your uh, your phone bills or your yeah. internet bills. And, and so at the time... There was really, if you wanted to acquire knowledge, there was no alternative to reading. None. Mm. Every morning I would wake up at four or five. I would read the Wall Street Journal cover to cover. I would read the Financial Times cover to cover before the day even got started. Whoa. Every day. I and even I'm, have files. And, and I'm sure with a great cup of coffee, man. <laughs> yeah, I, was coffee. Uh, I was too I was too poor then to afford cigars. Now I have cigars every morning yeah, with my coffee, yeah, but yeah. back then it was coffee, no <laughs> cigar. Um, but I I would cut these um, newspaper clippings, mm -hmm. like any article that I saw. For instance, they would do these profiles mm -hmm. on Financial Times on mm -hmm. very successful people. I would cut them off with a pair of scissors, and I had a folder where I kept them. So. Back then, there, there was really no alternative to reading. You had to read. Hmm. And, and every, every one of those books, um, I would read them with two things. Whenever I sat down to read, I had a yellow high right, highlighter and I had a red pen. Hmm. So I, I would yellow highlight things that struck me mm -hmm. and things that double struck me, hmm. I would underline them in red. <laughs> I like this guy. Yeah, under the yellow highlight. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and it's funny, Paul, because today when I go up to my library, sometimes I remember something from 10, 20 years ago. I <laughs> grab a book. I just sort of open it and I kind of flip to, through it. And I, I start looking for those yellow and red, whoa, yellow highlights and red books that I haven't opened in 15 years. My you goodness. So, so what I did back then was almost kind of like cataloging these books in my memory. That's right. So That's today, right. when I confront a situation that sort of reminds me of something I'd read in a certain book, I'd recall the book. I may not remember the particular chapter, but I'll go up to my library there and I'll pull out the book and I'll just sort of flip through it and kind of search through the yellow. And sometimes I would dog ear them, mm. right? Sometimes I would dog ear the pages. So... And and for me, that's sort of a way of revisiting sort of all that knowledge and my past. So um, fast forward to today, it's a different world. Yeah. Um, yes. Everything is, you know, information is consumed differently, mostly yes. visually. Yes. You know, which I feel really poorly for this kid today because there's something to be said about reading, especially as it has to do with your vocabulary. Yes. And even your thinking. Yes. Because when you read a book, and when you see a movie, are two completely different things. Totally. When you totally. see, a movie, I like to say I don't watch movies. I'm not a. I'm not a. I don't have the time. One. I only watch movies when I'm on an airplane. But if I have a choice between reading a book and watching a movie, I'd read the book. And this is why, because a movie is one man's interpretation of a story. Hmm. It's the director's or the producer's inter in, in, interpretation of a specific story. When you read a book, you are the movie director uh, and producer because that movie is playing in your head. Ah, uh, I never saw it that way, man. I never saw I never saw this, this kind you of... You understand story. what I mean? Nah, I get it. So, it ignites your imagination yeah. in a way that movies never will because uh, with movies, someone's done already half of the work mm. or more. Someone's done all the heavy lifting. That's right. Right? That's so, right. there's there's very little left for the imagination once it's all converted from a story into moving pictures. Whereas with the book, these are just words. You know, these are just words on a page. And you are the producer, you are the director of that movie playing in your mind. And it excites your imagination and it trains your imagination in interpretation, in context, 
um, in a lot of ways. Mm. Uh, it, it brings this sort of neural pathways yes. in ways that I think visual learning does not. Yes. However, um, all that said, we are where we are. It's a different world um, today. Uh, information is consumed visually. Yeah. Um, I still read from time to time, uh, but very it's very seldom that I would, I would sit down for hours and just sort of, you know, slogging yeah. through a book, except I'm traveling and sitting yeah. on an airplane. You know, I have nothing better to do when I'm dressing. But today, uh, my routine consists mostly these days, I get up and I go through my TikTok. Mm. Mm. So I go through TikTok where I see people like you mm. um, and other podcasters, you know, sort of this sort of bits and bits. And Elon Musk does much the same thing as well. Yeah. And he gets up in the morning, he goes through his TikTok feed. I mean, a lot of it is crap, right? Yeah. Um, and kind of, but after a while, the algorithm figures, it sort of figures out the sort of things that you like. That's so right. I like a lot of like motivational things or business lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go through all I spend about half an hour going through that and whatever I see that strikes me, I download it. Yeah. And very often I I would share it with my team yeah. on our corporate side because we have a Slack platform which okay. we use as, a, as an office. And so uh, whatever strikes me, especially business lessons or entrepreneurial lessons, uh in marketing, finance, whatever it is, uh, yeah. I, I sort of bookmark it and then I might share it with with my uh, colleagues on the corporate Slack. Uh, otherwise, I have a folder on my phone, <laughs> which serves as my uh, as as the, the folders the, I used. To yeah, the digital you know, version of that. Now, what I do is that on my phone, I have a folder where I sort of you know kind of park all of that stuff, oh, uh, so that powerful. I can go back and revisit them. So that is the main difference between I think how I absorbed uh, information, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and how uh, one absorbs learning and, and information today. It's far, it's far. As founder of uh, Ask OK, uh, um, you've seen technology. You've seen the power of e-commerce. If you were to give an advice to people in the fashion industry, what would you tell them? Because I don't think they are evolving as fast as other industries are in terms of using these tools that we have to move their businesses forward? What would you tell them? Well, you know, um, clothing is a very interesting thing. Um, it, it took us a while. I remember, I'll tell you a little story, uh, Paul. Mm. You know, my first entrepreneurial venture was a company called Sift Bay. I founded that company my first company coming out of Wall Street as a young man, um, it failed. Um, one of the lessons, of course, that one has to hmm. <laughs> learn in yeah. life. Yeah. It not. Um, and the reason it failed wasn't because it wasn't a sound. It was a great idea. In fact, so great that we started this company a year later, PayPal was announced. Whoa. And it was a money transfer. It was an electronic digital money transfer company. And it was such an elegant, simple idea. I was sitting down with a buddy of mine in Toronto. We went for Caribana, hmm. this Caribbean festival. And we started talking about, you know, people who sent money home and how, why do you have to go to a Western Union? And it's just cumbersome and tedious. Is there no way? And the internet was, internet was just new then. Hmm. And we said, well, there's got to be a way of doing this over the internet. And so we started thinking, he used to, uh, the gentleman worked at Bell Labs at the time in Bell, Canada. Mm. And we started thinking, thinking, putting things together. And eventually both of us sort of kind of, I left my, I left my job on Wall Street. And uh, we got together and we created this company called SitBay. Now, the problem was that the internet was so new that people, when you, when you told people to sort of provide their bank account information or credit card information online, it was an absolutely non-starter. Mm. Non-starter. Because we built this platform, we created this digital platform, but to be able to sort of to get or to be able to sort of, you know, collect the money, it has to be digitally done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so either the sender needs to use their credit card information or bank routing number or bank, you know, ACH mm. uh, to set up an account with us to be able to do it. But it was impossible to get people to do that. Mm. 
because they just didn't trust it. Ah, you know, I, I'm not going to put my credit card information on the internet. Mm. This was barely 20 years ago, Paul. Mm. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now we do it so thoughtlessly. That's right. Now we do it so thoughtlessly. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, we don't even think about don't it. Think about it, man. So we had an amazing idea that was just ahead of its time. Mm. Elon Musk came along, but he had $200 million in his pocket. Mm. And he could weather the storm. He threw money at it. We didn't have $200 million until we ran out of money I see. before the idea could actually take root. So mm. the reason I bring that up is that I see similar parallels to what we're doing today here at Askopia. Mm. We created a digital platform to make bespoke clothing. It yeah. works. What a question of does it work or not? We have customers. Mm. It's tested. It works. We have customers. but getting people to sort of shift their paradigm in thinking mm. that to have a properly tailored suit that you don't have to physically go to an old stooped man with a tape, you know, who's going to go through the whole mm. song and dance and ritual of measuring you. It is so etched into the psyche of people that that is what represents a bespoke garment. Mm -hmm very difficult to sort of to shift them or sort of to, to, to shift their minds. And, and this is a narrative. Again, this is a paradigm that is over 100, 200 years old, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the old way of tailoring has existed for 100 years now. One could argue it's on its last legs, you know, like the, the firms on Savvy Road, they're slowly dying mm -hmm. for all the reasons, including the, just the cost of running a business, you know, yeah. the cost of rent paid there. Uh, it's just extraordinary and all other all costs as well. And so for us, there is no question in our mind that this is the future. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a question of waiting out the storm till there is that paradigm shift. Uh, I, I've been down this road before. Before, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been down this road before. So I know when I look at this elephant, when I look at, I know, <laughs> I know the lion I'm dancing. Yes. <laughs> I I've see. seen him before. I see. Yeah, I see. I see. You understand? Very, very. So well, it, it's it's the same with I think you your question was is the fashion or clothing industry evolving? Yeah. Yes. Yes and no, and yes in the sense that obviously shopping has been made so much easier in terms of it's virtual. You can go to there's so many different websites where you can now sort of shop virtually. Mm -hmm. For I would say consumer clothing or let's say consumable clothing yeah you know, sort of you want to buy a cheap pair of jeans okay 50 bucks right yes, yes. Nah, okay, no big deal right um there are a lot of places there's just sort of an enormous amount of outlets for that and e-commerce has um significantly you know with companies like shopify amazon of course and yes. all the other e retailers out there that's that's already done right in terms of just purchasing uh, consumables, when I say consumables, clothing consumables, meaning, you know, things like your underwear, your socks, things, yeah. but the challenge comes with higher ticket items. Mm. Like yours. What I mean. Like yours. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. For instance, how many people would buy a Louis Vuitton bag? How many women would, would purchase a Louis Vuitton bag from some sort of strange website, mm. you know, for $4,000? It's not probably not gonna happen, right? <laughs> yeah. They would rather walk into the, store, the store and yeah. actually, you know, look at it and okay, it's an authentic, you know, Louis Vuitton product. So what has to happen, I think it's a confluence of things. One obviously sort of the process, you know, for us, things like data capture is, mm -hmm. is a big challenge. You know, how do we sort of capture the data, the measurements? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got um, scanning technology is moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, very soon, you'll be able to sort of use your phone to scan yourself and take your measurements. For us, that's going to be a game changer. Yeah. For us, that's going to be a total game changer. Because once you can sort of take your, use your phone and get your own physical measurements, then it's just, it eliminates a major bottleneck yes. for us. Yes, it's game over. So things like scanning technology or even things like rendering, 
um, say for instance, someone wants to order a garment online. They want to want they want to know how is it going to look on me, right? Mm -hmm. AI is advancing at such a pace; it's mm -hmm. almost scary. It's really, really. You scary. can literally sort of create a hologram of yourself, Paul, mm -hmm. and sort of create a garment, a rendering of a specific garment that you want to buy from us, and we can render it for you in 3D, and you can actually see what this suit looks like on you before you even purchase it or before wow, you have it. Wow. That wow. is not five years away. Wow. You understand? It's not five years. I'm not talking 10 years. Hmm. I'm not talking 10, 15 years. I'm talking things like virtual rendering are going to be available in the next three to five years for hmm. sure. Hmm. 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 So... So I think what you've seen in fashion uh, is just the first part of it, which is just sort of mass consumption. Yes. Yeah. So, Prof, we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're talking about change. Someone once said that th yeah. there's nothing that is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Absolutely. Yeah, um, but, but sometimes some people have to wait it out. Those are the pioneers. It's like fintech or any other industry today. So I think that you are at the leading edge. You are the, you are the top of the mountain in terms of this fashion and technology. So I, I, you look like someone that has the stamina to wait it out. So... We're rooting for you. You know, <laughs> you know what Judge Bush said, right? You know, fool me one, shame on you. Fool me twice. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Bro. Fool me one, shame on, shame on, shame on you. Fool me twice. <laughs> yeah, yes, so, yes. All right. Well, that that is that is the story of entrepreneurship. You see, mm. um, you know, it's an overnight success. Success really takes twenty years. Mm. See that again, man. <laughs> twenty years. It really takes twenty years. And my first entrepreneurial venture was exactly about twenty years ago. A little mm. bit about twenty years ago. Mm. You know, the business that I mentioned to you. Yes. And you know. Sort of, when you know you have to go back to Wall Street and then you and you know you keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and it takes a while, you know, to find your path. Uh, it takes a while to find your path, and when you find your path, you know it. Yes. yes. Because you know people think of entrepreneurship as this. So I'm going to go start this type of business or that kind of business or that kind of business. But sometimes a type of business comes and meets you. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. It surrenders itself to you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Fully. It comes to you. Completely. And you know, without any real, without any precedent. Mm. You know, what we're doing has zero precedent. Nobody's ever done this before. Yes. It's just me sitting down here thinking about, okay, this is how I currently make my clothes now. I love clothing. I write about it. I've read extensively on it. And I invited my, my COO, uh, 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 well, he, he, I invited a software engineer to my yeah. office who is now currently our CEO. And, you know, you've got this guy who's an entrepreneur, banker with, a, with an interest in clothing, and you've got a software engineer. So, okay, you know, we put these two together. What do you know? Just shake it up, and what do you what do you get? You get asco key. So you know this is not something that we said. Oh, you're gonna set out to be like that or like that. Mm. Um, it's just sort of you. You sit down. There's a problem, or at least sort of there's a problem. Not a problem, but there's there's a challenge, uh, and you try to figure out how do I solve for mm -hmm. this challenge. Mm -hmm. And in solving for that challenge, you know, an opportunity arises. So, and that's why I say sort of, it's, you know, sometimes it comes to you. It's not you sort of saying, I'm going to start the next uh, investment bank or the next private equity firm or the, you know, acquire the next, which is what I did for a lot of years. Mm. I did mm. that for a lot of years. Mm. You know, one of my, the most influential uh, people, one of the people that influenced my life the most is a gentleman called Reginald Francis Lewis. I, 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 uh, wanted, to, I wanted to ask that question. 
right yeah. now. And his um, book is why should white, white guys have all the fun. <laughs> have all the fun. <laughs> you know, the book is still here. Let's see how this book. Why should white boys have all the I ate that book so many times. It's so dog eared. And you know, uh Reg was a corporate lawyer mm. who turned uh MA uh MA corporate buyout artist. And I remember studying that book literally like your physics textbook. Every hmm. page. Hmm. Every page, every deal. You know, I sort of, I read it through. I studied it like, uh, like, a, like a science text. And what happens is that you take all of this and you try to apply it to your own life. Okay, I'm going to be... I'm going to be a junior reg. I'm going to be the next reg. I'm going to be the next Steve Jobs. I'm going to be the next, uh, 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 um, what's his name? Uh, Bill Gates. I'm going to be the next. You know, the thing about all these great names is that there are no nexts. Mm. There are no nexts. These people were unique for a time and place. And that time and place played to their unique specific strengths. Yes. Yes. And they were they were they were sort of um uh quick minded enough or conscious enough or uh or conscientious enough to be able to pick up that baton and run with it. Mm. And that is how life works. That's real. And I think the mistake that most people make, including myself, is that you try to be the next that guy. And it often leads to frustration, as I've found out, a very difficult way. It, it's really important to read these biographies and to lean on, uh, on, on, on their body of experience or sort of the combined body of experience of all these people to be able to, it, it helps you to frame a path. Mm -hmm. or it helps you create a framework. Yeah. Right? It, it, it creates the borders of the painting, but then you have to paint. Yeah. You've got to do the work. You've yes. got to actually use your own imagination and paint on that canvas. Mm. And I think that's, that's really where I certainly struggled um, is sort of trying to find, trying to find your own picture, your own painting. So yeah. where is my own music? Mm. And you try a lot of things. You try this. You try that. You know. You you you. And, and which is part of the process. Yeah, it's part it of is. the discovery. Yes, part of the growth process. And, and when you find yourself, right, most times it comes to you. Really, it's not you sort of going out there. And and and. Uh, so so yes. Um, it's uh it's uh, I know we've sort of. Yeah. From no, no I, 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 I love the way we, I love the way I love the way we entered it. We're, we're weaving. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, mean, I mean, it's it's like two guys having a great conversation, and other people have to listen to the to 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 a conversation that we had. That that's that's how I like to run my podcast. It's a great conversation. Um, another thing I noticed about you is that you know you have your four pillars, and one of the pillars is health. And I noticed that if you want to go at an area, you just study about it, maybe deeply or a little bit, and then you go about it. There's a guy, there's a book you read called Starting Strength by a guy called Mark Ripton. Yes. And at some point, you were carrying 260 kilos. Like, yo, <laughs> yo. <laughs> like, ah, ah. <laughs> I remember the first video I saw of you, called Introducing a Man. Ask Oki, okay, you are ripped, man. Like, yeah, this guy. <laughs> how as how does I I work out? I mean, I just I went to the gym this morning about um, six a.m. in the morning, and I found out that sir, every time I work out, when I stick to the regimen, it does something to me. It's like a keystone habit. It just affects every other thing. I don't know the sign. I tell my sons, look, you gotta work out, man. I don't know how. What is the neurotransmitters? You just function better. Can you tell me about this? Well, uh, the, uh, let me start with the book Starting Strength uh, by Mark Ripto. I remember specifically, it was somewhere around 2011. I've always been active. I've always sort of played some kind of sports. Uh, you know, I mean, I've had breaks outside the gym, um, or, but never more than a year. Um, you know, ever since I, was, I went to a military school, I attended military school. So it was something that was quite 
uh, part of my character, having mm. a type of military school. But, but specifically speaking about powerlifting, mm. uh, it was in 2011 or so. I remember I'd been out of the gym for about a year. I'd gone through a very rough period, mm. uh, and I will get into that story. Mm. Uh, but I got through a very rough period and and he threw me completely off. And I think when you go through this rough period, I think everything kind of suffers, including yes. your yes. your your habits. Your, your routines, yeah, yeah. Your, your routines, everything. So I remember one day, I remember specifically, I went to a Christmas and a New Year's Eve party, and we'd had a lot of champagne the night before. It was in 2011, I think New Year's of 2012. We had a lot of champagne and, uh, you know, I woke up in the morning and I went into the bathroom mirror and uh, hung over and I took a good look at myself and I said, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Mm. And I remember, you know, I can always tell about where I am in life when I look at my body. Come on, it's man. It's never been false. Come on, man. Never, ever, Come ever, on, ever, man. ever. You know, mm. whenever I look at what I look like, I could I could go back and look at all my pictures going back 20 years even, right? And whenever I was sort of bent out of shape physically, my life was a mess. Not a mess, but I was probably going through a certain top of some one sort of crisis or the other. Mm. Without fail, right? I could match every period, whatever I looked like physically, was a reflection of everything else in my life. Mm. 100%. Mm. And so I remember standing in front of the mirror and I, and I looked at myself and, and, I, and I knew and I knew that something was wrong. Mm. And if something was wrong in the mirror, something then, then obviously things, a lot of things were wrong mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I told myself, well, I've been down this path many times and the only way to, and I was going through a crisis, quite frankly, like I said, I wasn't going, I wouldn't go into it, but I knew that the only way I would be able to come out of that crisis was to fix what I was looking at in the mirror. Mm. And so I started, you know, I went back in the gym, started powerlifting, I started learning basic squats, deadlifts, uh, shoulder press, just the basic things. And then, as with all things, um, once you start sort of seeing gains and improvement, I'm, I can be very uh, obsessive. Some people will say OCD. <laughs> OCD. I have a, I may have a mild version of OCD or severe version of it, mm. depending on who you ask. Uh, if you ask my, my colleagues, they'll tell you I have a severe version of OCD. <laughs> but I can be quite, yeah, yeah, I can be quite obsessive, uh, uh, um, compulsive. And so once I sort of noticed, okay, you know, I, I, I kind of get a hang of this thing. I, I, I started researching um, on the internet, came across Mark Rito, watched some of his uh, YouTube videos, and then ordered his book. And this book is just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, basically, it's, it's not just, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a book on biomechanics. Mm. Or it teaches you about the biomechanics of body, how the body, you know, literally it's, it's a science book that is basically uh, sold as a sports book or sort mm. of a lifting book. But uh, he's, uh, Mark is very, very knowledgeable, extremely knowledgeable in that arena in biomechanics. And so I, I went even beyond just sort of learning how to pace yourself and how to sort of, you know, to more understanding how the body works, the mm. body mechanics and how to, uh, and so on and so forth and and from there I just sort of you know over the years I started from like literally nothing and at some point I was deadlifting uh you saw some of my pictures yes uh, I was deadlifting at the at the max I was deadlifting almost 270 kilograms at, at at 100 kilo body weight Jesus Christ I was I was barely over 100 kilos and I was deadlifting 2.6, 2.7 times my body weight. I was squatting 200 kilos easily. What? Two times my body weight for five reps. Yeah. <laughs> I was squatting my body weight, twice my body weight for five reps. I was deadlifting, you know, uh, my one rep max was maybe 270 kilos. 
you know, easily I was deadlifting below 200 for reps easily. Um, shoulder press, I was doing 100 and 150 kilo shoulder presses. Uh, I was massive. I was massive. And the thing about uh, power lifting is that, of course, as you as you improve, as you sort of as your numbers go up, you have to get bigger. Mm. Because that's the only way your numbers are going to go up. Yeah. So obviously, that led me down the path of dieting as well, understanding diet, understanding yeah. how to eat, um, how to eat lean meats if you wanted to put on weight, you know, what kind of proteins to eat and what to avoid, and so on as you know, having your meals made at home, prepackaged. So I learned a lot in that path, just mm. sort of, you know, getting that, getting on that journey with Mark Ripto and sort of trying to get to the possible end of it as well as as far as my natural body could get yeah and when i grew about 105 kilo i knew i had maxed out hmm. when, when my body weight got to 105 kilos i knew i had maxed out my natural ability to put on muscle hmm. and obviously that limits your ability to, to lift, move more weight remove, yeah so so for me that max was at about the 200 uh, kilo squat uh, it was at about of 270 kilo deadlift and I was body weight. I was about 105 kilos, less than 10% body fat, mm. maybe about 85% ripped. <laughs> but I knew I couldn't go any further, you know, mm. naturally. I started, you know, sort of fully started getting into foolish, playing foolish games. But, but you know, I, I, so what I'm trying to say is that for me, it was, um, it was a journey, mm. you know, it was sort of like, this is this thing, powerlifting, we're going to get to the end of it. Yeah. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get to the end. We sort of to get to the, the, the possible, the, the, you know, sort of the, the farthest we can get. Mm -hmm. And so that obviously involves learning a lot, you know, learning about yourself, you know, acquiring new information, new knowledge on diet, on, on the physics of the body, on rest, on just a, a lot of things. But all those things also, obviously, needless to say, is that they also develop character. How do you mean? Well, they develop character in the sense that you can't, you can't go from, I was what? Uh, I was maybe 75 kilos. You can't put on 20, 30 pounds of muscle without having discipline. Yes, conscientiousness, focus, planning. Without having discipline. Yes, that's right. That's right. You have to be very, very disciplined, consistent, day in, day out. It's a grind mm. to do that for years. And I did that from starting from 2011 till about 2017, Ooh. where I hit my max in 2016, right? where I hit my max around 2016 and 17, and I decided to change my body shape after that. Hmm. Did that so, help you in, in what, what you were, did, did that help you in, even though you want to go into, but did that help you in dealing with what you were dealing with as at that time in any way, shape? Of or course, of course, of course, I think so. I think so, because what happens is that you, um, it forces you, it forces you, 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 you know, I think I don't remember. I think it was Sun Tzu, or, or was it was it uh, Confucius who says that um, no man can conquer the world without conquering himself. Self, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you want to conquer the world, you start with conquering yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when you put yourself through um, that type of rigor. Mm. Your body learns to respect your mind. Mm. Oh, this guy's deep. <laughs> Jesus. It's powerful, man. Oh. You understand what I mean? So much. Uh, at a very deep level. I get it. <laughs> your body learns to, to take respect order your, your mind. mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And what you can understand that concept. Because um, obviously a lot of our shortcomings in life come from the body, really. You know, from the, the sensory organs, right? Our eyes, our skin, our... Yeah, yeah, our yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know, I don't need to go into details, but, uh, you know, a lot of our, uh, let's say, um, 
uh, vices mm -hmm. in life uh, are a result of our our sensory organs, yeah, and, uh, which are all part of the body, right? So the body ultimately must submit to the mind to accomplish any great thing entirely. The body must submit entirely to the mind. And the only way you do that is by completely obliterating the body. Mm. Like fitting it into submission. Mm. Literally. And that is what I did with powerlifting. And then when even when I stopped powerlifting, I took up boxing. Yeah, you took up because boxing. I wanted, to, I wanted yeah. to shed off all of that because I started getting into Askoki. I, I started preparing myself for this where we are today. And I knew that if I was going to be the face of the brand, that I needed to sort of have a certain physique, yeah. and um, and and which meant I needed to change drastically my um, everything I had built for six, seven years. I had to cut everything out. I had to lose twenty pounds of muscle in a Whoa. very short period of time. Whoa! Which I think so a lot of that hard-earned muscle, I had to sort of give a lot of it <laughs> for good cause because I wouldn't be able to wear these suits today if I wear if, you know if I if I had that physique or the yeah. physique I had back then. Wow. So Paul, that's that's sort of the the connection I think between the rigor of an exercise routine or physical routine and other aspects of your lives. Yeah, it's powerful. Other aspects of it's you know, they're inextricably linked. Yeah, they are. They are. They are. You know, it's they're powerful. inextricably inextricably linked because, you know, think about it, Paul. You know, all the things that keep you from success, quote unquote, or accomplishments, things like procrastination or just sort of laziness yeah. uh, or lack of focus. A lot of those things you have to deal with every time you walk into the gym. That's right. That's right. You have to be focused. You know, you, you know, you have to get rid of the lethargy, you know, all the excuses, you know, you can't procrastinate. So if you if you literally force your body to do that every day. Yeah. It, <laughs> oh, my your, God. Your, your neural pathways start to change. That's right. So that That's when you are confronted with a challenge that is one outside of the gym, mm -hmm. be it in business or your your studies or what have you those neural pathways are still functioning yes and they no. take over it's true that's why someone said that so too. so in many ways you know physical training is 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 just it's not just training your mind your body it, it it's really the body is just the manifestation but what you're really training is your mind. mind wow wow someone once said that the heaviest weight is the door of the gym <laughs> Once again, uh, once again, crank that. That's that. Right. <laughs> once again, get past that. <laughs> wow, I'm so okay. That, the rest is this has been a fascinating, my goodness, fascinating conversation. Wow. Mm -hmm. Lastly, lastly, you joined BlackRock in 20, uh, 2003. You work with the great yes. Larry Fink. Man, this right. dude, you work with Larry. legends, man. Ralph Schloss died. My goodness. Larry, uh, Larry was the boss and uh, Ralph was a favorite of mine. Was what was it uh, like to work with people that want to take over the world from the get-go? They well, ain't playing, you know, man. Black Rock <laughs> at the time was, um, it wasn't the Black Rock of today. You know, yeah. Black Rock was a boutique back then. Mm -hmm. um, this was the early 2000s. So there was a proliferation of of boutiques, you know, you had Blackstone, obviously KKR had been around for a while, you know, a few private equity shops here and there, a few hedge funds here and there. Um, so it was coming out of the 90s, um, where which was dominated by the large bulge bracket firms. Mm. A lot of the guys who were at the top of these bulge bracket firms, Wall, Wall Street firms, they were leaving to start all this uh, cottage, essentially a cottage industry. Um, private equity hedge mm. funds, what we call alternative finance today. And Larry and uh, Ralph both were working for Steve Schwartzman mm. at Blackstone. Mm. And Steve Schwartzman, 
who was the founder of Blackstone, said, you know, Larry and Ralph, you run my asset management business because they were primarily a private equity firm. Mm. But they had some money, you know, that let's say cash, they would just, it was, it actually literally was started as a treasury mm. for Blackstone to manage their excess cash. So it was Blackstone asset management. And, but it wasn't really, it was, like I said, they were basically using them as treasurers to manage their cash. So Ralph and, and Larry said, listen, um, listen, uh, Steve, why don't we buy you out, right? Why don't we buy out? Why don't we carve out this small Blackstone yeah. asset mining and yeah. just let's go do our own thing? Yeah. That's how Blackrock was started. Whoa. So they went off. I think they got some money from PNC Bank and someone else, you know, basically to help them to buy uh, the firm out from Steve, uh, Steve Schwartzman. And they set up shop and then they basically started as, as a bond shop, managing bonds, liquidity instruments for banks, pension funds, you know, and so on and so forth. And so when we went, when I was there, uh, we were, we didn't even manage equities at the time, mm. you know. Our main clients were agencies, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, um, a lot of governmental or sort of quasi-governmental institutes that issued a lot of bonds. Mm -hmm. So because that was our strength was quantitative analysis. Yeah, we had sort of all this very complicated to, you know, sort of sophisticated analytics tools. Mm. Uh, we had a lot of PhDs from MIT, from Princeton mm. uh, in physics. Uh, Wow. that were sitting there and developing all these sort of quantitative tools uh, to analyze liquidity, duration, mm. Mm. Uh, things like building these models. And so um, our job was essentially to figure out how to make, you know, how to sort of take that load of managing liquidity away from these large institutions. Uh, and that's how BlackRock started. And so as they became more successful with that, you know, managing short bonds, liquidity instruments, uh, near-term maturity bonds, treasuries, and so on and so forth, as they became more and more successful and attracted more capital, um, they sort of branched into other areas like equities and commodities and real estate and all whatnot. Mm. Uh, and then they started acquiring, you know, how they really grew was they, they started acquiring State Street, then, you know, the, the other one, and then the other one, and then they just literally over, not overnight, but over a period of time became a behemoth. They um, compounded. <laughs> but at the time I was there, I mean, we might have been 200 people, mm. you know, my, it was a small boutique, you know. Mm. This move might have been 200 people total, the whole firm. Today, it's tens of, you know, who knows, maybe 10,000 people. Wow. 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 Fascinating. This is, a, this is a good way to end this conversation. I want to say a really, really big thank you to you. Big, 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 big thank you to you. And the power of the internet for bringing us uh, uh, um, together. Uh, so if people want to read more about you, check you out more, where, where's the best pla pla platform you want to send? But of course, I'm going to put Ask Oki uh, website on, in, the show, in the show notes of the website, of the podcast. Where else would you want them to go to? Well, look, uh, if Paul, I have yet to write a biography. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I haven't written a biography yet, but... I think if you're uh, resourceful, you could probably piece together uh, uh, a synthetic biography mm. of Prof uh, through several sources. Yeah. Um, there is, we do have a YouTube channel. Yes, of course, very, uh, very good YouTube channel. I'm, I'm, I'm going to link that. I'm going to link that. Very educative. And, uh, in that YouTube channel, uh, on uh, I think our our newer videos with that we've shot professionally in a studio. The second series was was sort of a biopic of Prof, mm. and I think you may have actually watched that. So uh, we intentionally created that segment just to talk about Prof and how the idea of ICO ASCO came about, and just for those who are curious to know more about yeah. uh, Prof himself. So it's it's about an hour long, uh, Captain. Would you say it's about a fifty minute video, forty five minute video? Um, and it's quite expensive. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't give you the entire bio, but I think I was able to touch on a lot of, not just my history, but uh, my philosophy. 
Yeah. Um, so that's drive me and, you know, my whys. Mm. And then why are Goki most important here? Fantastic. So I think that's a good summary. Uh, that's a good video. If you'd like to point people, I'm, I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna put that in the in the show notes in a specific um, direction. If you know, for them, for, for me as a person, not yes. the not the corporate body, of course. Yes. yes. Uh, for the corporate body, of course, uh, that we have multiple platforms. We have our website, of course. You know, which has our digital shop on there, www.askoki.com. We're always on Instagram, we're on YouTube, we have a Discord community, we're on Facebook, and we're constantly looking for ways to expand our digital footprint. So Ask Oki as a business uh, has several, there's so many ways to, to find us. But for me as a person, absent, um, ha not having actually authored a biography. Yes, <laughs> it's gonna, um, it's gonna uh, happen. That video, I think it's sort of, it's a fairly, comprehensive summary of um of the professor wow fantastic do you still i thought i'd show you my own copy of the book um the do you still you spoke about it this is the 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 meditations of marcus aurelius oh yeah 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 this, I is, have this, it is, here. this is my copy <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah um, so I have it here in my study. Yes, yeah. uh, it's among, such a great uh, book. Such a great book. Great, great, yeah, great. Along with, uh, along with Seneca and uh, yeah. Epictetus, is a yeah. stoic of course. Yes, it, yes. You did bring up somewhere earlier in the conversation something about philosophy. Um, yes, and we didn't get into that, but that's going down another rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, yeah. Really I, I have a feeling that this conversation will have a part two. <laughs> this is gonna hit <laughs> the, the internet. Time, we can. This I would is really gonna, like. I would. I would really love to take you down that rabbit hole. I'm yes, awesome. this is gonna <laughs> hit. But this is good. This conversation is gonna hit really, really hard on the internet. Ah, uh, Mister, Mister Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna say thank you, man. Thank you, thank you so much for oh. the for the for taking out your time to do this, and I'm sure it's gonna be a blessing to a lot of people when they listen to to this. Is to show everybody the power of the internet. The power of the internet. If not for the internet, I don't think I'll be having this conversation with, with Mr. Oki today. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in person very, very soon to have a cup of coffee, share a drink, and learn how to smoke a cigar. <laughs> where I am sitting, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop the recording. <laughs>